Do you ever feel like the whole world has gone insane? Yeah, you're not alone. I feel that way. In fact, the majority of people feel that way. The truth is, we were all sold this great lie that being part of a silent majority was something we should be proud of. Being a silent majority allowed a very loud, angry group of people to control everything. And problem there is, that small group of people, they're communists. I say that myself as someone who's the son of a Cuban refugee who had to flee communism. I know the reality of how important the American dream is. I know how quickly we can lose freedom. And that's why this is our last stand. I'm your host, Robbie Starbuck, and I'm gonna be diving deep on the issues and people that matter so that together we can save the American dream and once again, become a loud majority that steers the direction of this country. If you're with me and you wanna spread truth and wake up the masses, you're in the right place. Together, one piece of truth at a time, we can save America. Today we've got with us Mia Cattell. She's a fantastic reporter, honestly, one of my favorite reporters in the country from uh, Town Hall. If you haven't read her work, you immediately need to follow her. And after you hear the details of this story, you're going to want to. Okay, so we're talking about an incredibly horrific story today about a gay couple who adopted children and then sexually abused them and trafficked them. First, I just want to thank you, Mia, for coming on the show, and then we'll dive right into the questions. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate you sharing this story. I'm so happy that it received the attention that it did. Well, it deserves the attention that it got because it didn't just break ground on this story. It opened a lot of eyes to problems within the adoption world and even, you know, some of the the signals and signs people are ignoring in the name of, you know, diversity and tolerance and inclusion. And that's something that could be incredibly dangerous, which is a big reason I wanted to highlight this story because I think there's a lot of red flags that people missed and they missed it in the name of inclusion and diversity and tolerance. And that could be incredibly dangerous. So, you know, my opening question to you would be, can you please sort of condense down and explain this story for people who have not heard it? Yes. So these two gay adoptive fathers who are prominent LGBT activists and the gay activist scene in Georgia are accused of a slew of felony child sex offenses, which includes incest, sodomy, felony prostitution of a minor for crimes they allegedly committed against their own adopted sons. These are two biological brothers who are adopted through a so-called Christian special needs adoption agency. And not only were they producing and distributing child pornography of the sexual abuse, they allegedly were pimping out their children to nearby pedophiles in these Atlanta area suburbs. And this was a story that, you know, it broke in July, August of last year. But since their arrest, we haven't heard anything, not even from local outlets like Atlanta Journal Constitution. It's a big outlet in Atlanta. And you would think uh, for something happening in their backyards, in their community, that would be something that the people would want to know. But we haven't heard anything. It's been a complete media blackout. And so I've been working with a family member uh, from the adoptive family who just wanted to seek justice for the boys because there just doesn't seem to be an advocate for them because the state's looking out for themselves. The state is partly responsible for placing them in harm's way. And so I worked with this family member. Uh, They shared jailhouse calls with the defendants. They showed me screenshots from their social media accounts, which they had access to. And it really was painting this huge picture that it wasn't just a domestic child abuse case. This is something much larger scale in operation a pedophile ring that's embedded in the suburb. Right. I wanted to ask you, just, you know, s- stopping right there with you taking the story on, why do you think, I know you talk to other journalists and, and there's a pulse there about, you know, the types of stories that are strategically, you know, greenlit and, and the ones that are held back. I understand that nobody likes talking about this issue or no journalist wants to, to dive into an issue this horrific. The scope of this abuse was just absolutely horrific. But is there a different, you know, vested interests that maybe people who run these organizations have, why they would not take a story like this? Well, I believe that since these were far left LGBT activists, they're part of a protected class in America. And so it would really disrupt that pro-inclusivity narrative if we exposed these crimes that they allegedly committed, even if it means ignoring violent child sexual abuse. So a lot of members of the media, I believe, were too afraid to approach the subject. 
because local outlets, they know the judicial court system. They know Georgia's courts very well. These were all public documents, publicly available court records, and yet nobody was digging into it and seeing these crimes just spelled out in black and white. Not local or federal, like nobody. No, I wasn't seeing anyone dig into it. The only one I saw was some very local outlet that said that they're due back in court next month, but that was wow. not it. So my question, too, because one of the things I found the most concerning, and there are a lot of concerning angles to this case, was the fact that there were a bunch of red flags during the adoption process to begin with that were just completely ignored. Can you tell people about those red flags? Yes, there is more than just warning signs that went unnoticed. The one adopted father, Zachary Zulock, was previously accused of luring a 14-year-old boy to a house in Walton County. This is the same jurisdiction as today's case and raping him there. But charges were never filed for some reason. And the district attorney's office even said the investigation was closed without a whole lot of investigation into it. So I reached out to Walton County Sheriff's Office and I asked what, what was the reason for this. And they said that they had different investigatory standards back then, which... This is 2011. It's a little over a decade ago. They're making it sound like this was a different century. This was a different era. This wasn't 50 years ago. So I don't know how they investigate child sexual abuse cases back then, child rape. But just to think of, you know, the mishandling of this case. And then, of course, they said the officers who mishandled the investigation have since retired. So I felt that their statement was a bit of admission of guilt as well. And oh, it was. So it, it created a domino effect that if Zachary could have been stopped all the way back then, then we could have never obtained these two children. And it's still just unconscionable to me that a previously accused child rapist would go on to adopt not one, but two children through a special needs adoption agency that they picked the most vulnerable children possible to adopt. I mean, you don't get more red flags than that. And, you know, I picked this part up of what you're saying in 2011. And when you read the statement from McGinley, the district attorney there, I mean, it is an admission of guilt. There's no other way to look at it. And he says it was closed without a whole lot of investigation into it. My question is, how many other cases of people being accused of child rape are going along with very little investigation and being closed? Because that seems like a big story in itself. Is that something you've looked into at all? I've been wondering about this because... I believe Georgia, the South, are very weird with sodomy laws because for the longest time, I believe they criminalized sodomy between two consenting adults. And so now in the social justice age, uh, they go to the other extreme. They don't want to touch it at all. And, you know, back then, Zachary was 23, 24. Still, he had no business being with a 14-year-old. But I wonder, because I, I public records requested the incident report that the case is based on. And the DA acknowledged that it exists and the sheriff's office acknowledges that it exists, but they denied my request. Uh, and I believe they accidentally sent me their internal emails debating on releasing the report to me. And they'd never officially said we've reopened it until their denial email. For a while, their language was, we're looking back into it. We, we want to review some things. And so when they finally decided, no, we're not going to release it. I mean, that just leads to more of an apparent cover up. Because I wonder if this police report was just one page scribbles from whatever responding officer who may have dismissed it as you know, like, God forbid, you know, like a lover's quarrel or just two boyfriends fighting and not a 14 year old who's naming his child rapist. Hey guys, just want to thank our sponsor, Patriot Mobile, a fantastic Patriot owned company that is challenging these big companies out there like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile who themselves are taking your money and then giving it to organizations and endeavors that you don't agree with. So why not make the change today? Change to a company that is in alignment with your values that will fight for school boards to be flipped. Yes, Patriot Mobile did that. They will fight for the truth to get out there to people. That's what they're doing today by supporting this show. So if you wanna be one of those people that is an actual change maker, that lives out their values, make the change today. If you're worried about service, do not worry. This company is working off of these same service standards that the major companies are. The trick is those companies, they wanna make you believe that they're the only ones you can trust. But the truth is you can't trust them with your money. So make the change today. PatriotMobile.com, promo code Starbuck. Thank you again to Patriot Mobile for supporting us. 
in our fight to share the truth with the world. I mean, just absolutely awful, 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 awful. And for the sake of clarity, we're talking about in this case, they raped these children that they adopted. They produced child pornography or child sexual abuse material of the children's routine sexual abuse. And they prostituted out their 11 year old boy to pedophiles in the area. Can you tell us how were they able to get away with trafficking their kid essentially to these other pedophiles in the area? It seems like they could have kept getting away with it if it wasn't for one of the men who was busted downloading child pornography of uh, one of the Zulok boys, uh, Hunter Lawless. He was apprehended first when a search warrant was executed on his own house. And that was because Google sent an emergency cyber tip to child protective organizations. Uh, and this was automatic, not a manual one. So I believe there might have been some kind of hit that their image identification technology that law enforcement uses sees there's already a, a hit in the database of child pornography. And so he was apparently downloading it with his Gmail account, or maybe he backs things up with his Google photos and didn't realize. And so that's how this whole investigation started. And once they reached Hunter's house, he ended up snitching on the Zulocks and saying, I'm not the ones who produced this. This is who was sending it to me. And then that's how they went from there. But they were operating using popular social media apps, Snapchat. They were using Grindr to connect with other child predators. Right. I wanted to dig into that a little bit, too, because um, in, in my work, you know, there, we've discovered that there's so many different hashes that allow pedophiles to organize openly on these social media platforms like Instagram, Ch Snapchat, Facebook, you know, Twitter, all of these. And it's still up till this day. They just change the name sometimes. But I mean, how how were they able to how was this able these crimes facilitated by big tech looking the other way or having failed protective policies in place to discourage um, the free trade of CSAM? Yeah, I I reached out to Snapchat and the spokesperson for its parent company, Snap Incorporated, sent you know, a pretty blanket statement saying, we condemn child sexual exploitation, the steps were taken, we ban children under the age of 13 from using Snapchat, like that's going to prevent kids from downloading it. And they still allow kids, you know, 13 to 18 to use Snapchat. And its intended use, like when it was created, was to send uh, nude photos with the guise of privacy that people think it's encrypted messages, it's instant, it's it's deleted right away. And so there's a lot of kids that end up using this. And there's numerous cases in other states of child predators obtaining child pornography that way, not just through another child predator, but directly from a child. Well, it's amazing they're able to do the censorship job they do on conservatives, but they're not able to get rid of child porn off of their apps. You know, when you look at this, in general, there's a problem just across the entire swath of social media because you you hinted on this age point, okay, saying, you know, Snapchat said they don't allow anybody under 13. Well, that's a farce in itself because all the kid has to do is lie about their age when they sign up and they don't require ID. They're not doing anything to actually check the kid's age. There's no actual backstop to say, hey, we're really going to protect kids. It's just, hey, if the kid lies, they're all good. And beyond that, there's so many parents ignorant of the use of an app like Snapchat. You know, they don't know that it started with the idea of sending naked photos secretly and that this is something that it's still used for. And to my knowledge, Snapchat doesn't deploy a technology that actually captures any of this and is able to take it down. And many kids end up in situations where they're even blackmailed over their nude photos that they take, that they send to somebody and are put in a position where they end up actually having worse abuse put onto them because of that situation that happened on a place like Snapchat. And this occurs all over the world, not just the United States. You know, one of the points I saw in your story that was really interesting was the fact that for a long period of time before he was ever caught, he was openly posting on Instagram photos of the boys and having interactions with other accounts who were designated as, quote, boy lover accounts, where they talked in very sexual open terms about little boys. How big of a, a problem is this on a place like Instagram where this was happening? And why do you think the adoption people involved, why did nobody catch on to this? Yeah, Instagram, there's a lot of child pornography, child sexual exploitation images. They're just running rampant on there. And it's not 
the, the sense of what people think child pornography looks like. There's still children in sexually suggestive positions, real children being exploited for grown men to do whatever disgusting things they do to these images. A lot of these pedophiles use terms like BL, which is short for boy lover, different kind of hashtags. They use like the whirlpool emoji, which is supposed to symbolize like the recognized boy lover symbol, which is like a, a triangle. And so that's how they use as dog whistles to connect with each other. If you look on Zachary's account and William's account, which has since been taken down in their bios, they both say that they're loving fathers to two beautiful, wonderful boys. And Zachary also listed his Snapchat username. And we know that's where he was sending the child pornography. That I saw that as come here, that, you know, this is our community. And as you're saying that there were uh, boy lover accounts that would follow Zachary and follow William that I just can't believe pedophiles are able to congregate on such a po popular app that children, middle school, even younger use. Well, these were, you know, prominent activists. I mean, they they were involved with the human rights campaign. I mean, you exposed a lot of what they're involved with, the no hate campaign. So why didn't the LGBT community who were looking at their socials and did, uh, you know, elevated their platforms to, you know, promote their uh, agendas and initiatives have any issue or notice that these hashes were being used or certain problematic friends and, and at requests to other pedophile networks. I mean, isn't it remarkable that not one reported that? You would think that human rights campaign, especially now with the story breaking a second time, would try to condemn, you know, the use of, that they were promoting that they took a selfie outside of their headquarters in DC. They especially highlighted like the gay part of the sign where it says like lesbian, gay, bisexual, et cetera that that was part of their promotional image and the whole irony and hypocrisy of it that the, what about the children's rights these children's these children were horrifically abused and so i just don't see any pro lgbtq organization coming out of the woodwork to denounce uh these members on that note i wanted to add something that i just thought about um you know human rights organization is actually one of the organizations too uh, that is supporting the new uh, American Law Institute recommendations that want to make, you know, child rape minimum sentence of two years, three years, I think it was, and abolish the sex offender registry. It, these are the types of organizations that are in support of these dangerous sweeping recommendations. Um, and that's something that I just discovered in my work that, you know, I thought was worth mentioning. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The recommendations from a ALI are just jaw dropping. I did want to ask you, you know, when it comes to just the overall environment that we find ourselves in that you talked about earlier, where it seems like so many institutions are afraid of questioning blatant red flags because they don't want to offend, quote, protected groups. You know, it takes me back to when I first heard the phrase love is love. And I really think we need to educate the public more on these things. And I'm interested to hear your take on this, because from the very beginning of hearing that phrase, I said, well, no, 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 it's not. Because, you know, if you're if you're somebody that thinks you love somebody, but you're actually a creepy stalker, your love is not love to that person. You're you're a threat to them. Same case in something like this. You can't say you romantically love a child. That's something that is is wrong. And I think on every moral and societal level, I think hopefully the majority of people can agree with that. But the phrase was given so much credibility by the media and it's become such an incredibly dangerous thing because again, another warning sign missed, these men were out there pushing that exact phrase, love is love, to help normalize the idea of being able to love anybody at any time and that that's something everybody just needs to accept. What do you think the answer is for us being able to get away from this dangerous ideology? Yeah, I think love is love is one of those bumper sticker slogans that can be warped easily by whoever wants to use it to say, you know, I love a child and it should be a valid kind of love when it's not lust, when it's not sexual abuse. And so that's one of the many umbrella kind of mantras that the left uses. And I, if anyone questions it, they'll say, no, I just want to love my partner. I just want to marry my partner and we just want equal rights. But the pedophiles have really adopted love is love. And, and as, as you're saying, it's a mainstream slogan and they want to add the P to the LGBT the, for pedophile and that they've embraced 
far left academia's kind of language, like minor attracted persons, to try to add euphemisms and destigmatize pedophilia and normalize sexual attraction to children. And that's just, it's not just a slippery slope. I think we've just taken a nosedive, and this is the implications of the sexual revolution. And I've always been suspicious of sex researchers, sexologists who make their whole passion, their whole field about sex when sex is no longer a sacred act between a man and a woman who are married. It's something that they want children, that they believe that children are sexual beings from birth. And it's just very dangerous ideology. Absolutely. I mean, I just saw a story yesterday that was a Planned Parenthood, quote, sex educator, which I blatantly just grouped deep in calling them that. I think they're groovers. Um, but she says that, you know, pleasure is the goal, you know, that they need to teach a pleasure based sex ed to kids because kids deserve pleasure at their age as children, not as adults once they get married or anything like that. But as children that they believe at Planned Parenthood that children are able to not only consent to this, but that they deserve the pleasure and was teaching kids how to buy sex toys without their parents knowing about it. I don't know how much further down this rabbit hole people can go before they realize we've reached peak crazy and this needs to stop. And that's sort of the thing I'm hoping for is an answer on how do we roll this back? How do we wake up the public to the insanity that has been allowed to, to become reality? I think we need to get a uh, sex education out of public schools because it starts with teaching them about uh, health and safety, STDs. And I guess, you know, I'm not as much of a pearl clutcher about that, but then they get into pleasure, you know, condom usage, that's part of the safe sex, but then they give out a million condoms to children in which they see it as like permission to go and be promiscuous. That looks like a rite of passage, like you're ready now, you're ready now, go go out and do this. Well, they're giving pleasure-based instruction. They're not just saying, hey, here's the risks. They're, they're literally saying, what it, what would be sexually pleasurable for you? There's writing prompts. There's It's grooming children into high-risk sexual behaviors without any stigma or judgment. So, you know, in, in many ways, they, they demonize vanilla sex, basic, you know, monogamous relationships, and they normalize fringe high-risk sexual behaviors, equivocate the same, you know, being able to have sex with anyone is just showing friendship. Some people just show friendship by having casual sex. You shouldn't judge that. You know, th this is what they're teaching in comprehensive sex ed now across America. And a lot of it is dictated by organizations like the human rights, like GLSEN, like Psychus. You know, that is why we're here in, in, in the schools. And, and one of the banned books that I was just thinking when you were mentioning that promotes Grindr in it for children to go online to get affirmation on a website like that. And that is exactly, that was the, one of the websites that you exposed in this, you know, piece here. I couldn't help but notice there are so many cultural markers. You know, the fact that they, they watch Disney Plus and they seem pretty concerned about canceling that instead of being concerned for the boys' welfare. You, know, you touched on so many things. The love is love sign, the Disney, you know, rainbow mouse sitting in their entryway. There were so many indicators, you know, the grinder that are touch points and, and, and almost red flags at this point in our culture indicating there's a problem but we're at a place where we can't even report we can't even say okay groomer we can't say hey this is problematic this person is using hashes that are inappropriate and connecting to pedophile networks we can't report them we can't say anything or we will be banned i mean how dangerous is our uh, a place that we're at now yeah i mean a lot of people were rightly appalled over the report but they don't realize that this is the culture that we have bred and that these two men are products of this over-sexualized society we're living in. Because these were grown 35, 33-year-old men, but they were posting at the rate of a 16-year-old TikTok influencer. They were using a million hashtags, hashtag gay men, hashtag hot guys, because they were trying to be seen and to rise to prominence. And yeah, that that's something that uh, really cultivated their kind of narcissistic, sociopathic personalities. And... Right now, it seems like they're some kind of cognitive dissonance while they're in jail, that they have no remorse. They don't realize just how heinous their crimes were. And it's all about, woe is me. I'm not doing so well in pretrial detainment. No asking about the boys. They don't care. Even if they were falsely accused, you know, a parent would naturally frantically ask about their children if the state has them, but they don't seem to care at all. Well, that's because obviously they were using the kids as objects and didn't see them as human beings. I mean, I think that's plainly clear, at least to me. 
Hey guys, just want to thank our sponsor, Patriot Mobile, a fantastic Patriot-owned company that is challenging these big companies out there like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, who themselves are taking your money and then giving it to organizations and endeavors that you don't agree with. So why not make the change today? Change to a company that is in alignment with your values that will fight for school boards to be flipped. Yes, Patriot Mobile did that. They will fight for the truth to get out there to people. That's what they're doing today by supporting this show. So if you want to be one of those people that is an actual change maker, that lives out their values, make the change today. If you're worried about service, do not worry. This company is working off of these same service standards that the major companies are. The trick is those companies, they want to make you believe that they're the only ones you can trust. But the truth is you can't trust them with your money. So make the change today. PatriotMobile.com, promo code Starbuck. Thank you again to Patriot Mobile for supporting us in our fight to share the truth with the world. My question too is, again, I go back to the adoption agencies. My mind is just blown that all these red flags were missed. What can you tell us about how this went by so quickly? Because it seems almost like this was expedited in terms of their ability to get the children. And then they continued to want more children, but the initial adoption agency they used went under and was no longer active and they were referred out to other adoption agencies. What can you tell us about this whole process and, and what happened? Yeah, so the family member who I worked with, they said that they passed everything with flying colors. There was an, a Facebook event page for their adoption shower that said that the adoption process was moving faster than expected. And so when I was looking at the timeline, it was relatively quick process compared to two-parent mm -hmm. households straight couples who are waiting lists for years and the process is arduous and yet they married in December 2017. The boys moved in in March 2018 and then the court made their family official in November 2018. So that was seven months after the boys moved in. That was very fast, very quick and they apparently did undergo background checks but I wonder since charges were never filed if the case was ever documented other than that incident report and so maybe there wasn't a hit in the system but other than that you would think for such an egregious crime as child rape that would pop up on adoption paperwork and as you were mentioning this now defunct agency facilitate local adoption in Georgia therefore special needs children and so this label of special needs they identified it as children who are older and have waited the longest children who are bonded sibling pairs which uh, the brothers fit that, and children who may be experiencing emotional, mental, behavioral disorders. So these children allegedly came from a broken home already with heroin-addicted parents. State intervened. Now they place them into this abusive household with two pedophiles. And now they're back in the foster care system. Seems like the cycle goes on. We don't know where they are. We don't know if they're safe. We don't know if they've started to heal. We can only pray for their safety. And so... Yes, it's just very egregious all around. There's a lot of wrongdoing, and it just doesn't seem like there's any kind of accountability at the state level. Weren't they trying to also adopt a two- to three-year-old little girl, and they were referred to a different agency? Can you speak more about that? Yes, so All God's Children Incorporated, which is the faith-based adoption agency they use, their executive director, she had a private Instagram chat with one of the adoptive fathers, and she revealed that they were dissolving, I believe because of COVID, it was just something like that. But Zachary, the one adoptive dad, said that they were trying to adopt again, but this time they wanted a girl. And another chat they, they said with a Facebook friend, they preferred a toddler age girl, preferably two or three. And, you know, any kind of adoptive parents, I don't think would speak about children like that. It's about adopting children into a loving family, not procuring a child, we would prefer two or three. Um, you, you just pray for a healthy young child. The executive director told them, here's my two top personal recommendations. One is Bethany Christian Services, which is the largest and most influential Christian so-called conservative adoption agency, and they are open to same-sex families. And then the other is uh, Chris 180 in Georgia, which uh, celebrates LGBTQ youth. Yeah, you know, I, I want to 
kind of hone in there on Bethany Christian services because I'm actually familiar with them because they're pretty well known in Tennessee. And I think there's a lot of Tennesseans who would be very surprised at other people in the South to find out that Bethany Christian services is not only allowing same-sex adoptions, but would miss, you know, sort of coming out and, and making a, a statement about this case. I think that would have been appropriate. You know, if, if you look at this on a wide level, I think there's a lot of problems in the adoption industry because what makes me so angry is the number of parents out there who wait for years and years and years to adopt a child only to be told at the end of the road, no, you can't, you can't adopt a child for ridiculous reasons, right? But then you have a case like this where all of these agencies have become so afraid and so paralyzed by the idea of saying no to somebody who's in one of these so-called protected categories that you end up missing all these red flags and you end up handing over children to pedophiles. You know, I think that this area needs a lot of reform. And I think that uh, organizations that are professing to be Christian conservative should be upfront with the people who they're asking for money from about the fact that they're willing to go and, and do adoptions with people who are, you know, let's say a transgender couple or something along those lines. But I think the Christian people giving money to the organization have no clue about that in general. And I think they deserve to know. I mean, do you think they try to conceal this fact in any way? I mean, what have you found in, in your work? Yeah, I believe a lot of these Christian-run organizations are terrified of being bullied, being made a public example of, because these cases that we've seen have gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. They don't want to be accused of being discriminatory or bigoted or homophobic. So they would betray their beliefs and even prioritize same-sex couples. But this particular agency, All God's Children Incorporated, I believe was just liberal-leaning to begin with, LGBTQ-friendly, and they were a grant recipient of the First Presbyterian Church of Athens. They hosted events there. They received funding in part by Pentecostal offerings. So I believe this church is one of those churches that proudly waves the pride flag in front of it and say, all are welcome. Uh, please don't throw bricks to our window. Well, it's pretty telling, in my opinion, that the first name that popped into their mouth after they went defunct was to recommend Bethany Christian Services. And thank God that those men never were able to get their hands on a little girl and abuse her the same way. But, you know, another question that's sort of posed out of all this is how far did this abuse go in terms of, you know, them trafficking these children out to other pedophiles in the area? Is there really a good handle on just how far this went? Or do you think there's potentially more perpetrators out there who have not been caught? What Zachary was willing to admit is that he sent the child sexual abuse material to less than a dozen people. So there were two that were busted, and I don't know if that's part of the count, which is the hunter guy and this other loser who was arrested on sexual exploitation of children charges. He also has an unrelated child sex offense for trying to coerce a child to engage in sexual acts with him by showing him child pornographic videos of other children he believed to be the child's age. So those are two guys. I believe they're very low rungs and they were very easy catches for law enforcement. But the district attorney said that there are still suspects out there who are circulating videos of these abused boys. And he says that they're still under investigation. But when I asked how many co-defendants is he looking at, all he would say are those two arrest warrants for Hunter and Viscaro Sanchez. And I also believe that it's within federal jurisdiction for the Department of Justice to get involved. I reached out to them, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Georgia, because they have prosecuted child sex related crimes in the past year, about a handful of them. And they just said we declined to comment. So I don't know if they're going to lost, launch a federal investigation. If local law enforcement is struggling, you would think they would really benefit from federal forces coming in and helping because we don't know how far reaching this is. All we see are these two suburbs in Georgia outside of Atlanta, but uh, these men were taking the boys on these Airbnb trips all over America to different states. And the implication is if they were raping them at home, they were doing it at these Airbnbs. So I, I don't know how extensive it is. What you just said is horrific, absolutely horrific that the, the local law enforcement know that there are other people out there trading the images of these abused children and they're not in handcuffs. I don't understand that. They, is there any sort of insight you can give me into why that makes any sense? 
you know, you would think that they would want to prioritize taking down these bad guys that are out there because the circulation of the, the child sexual abuse images perpetuates that cycle of trauma and abuse and victimizes the children. Because I know a lot of adult survivors of child sexual abuse, uh, they're re-victimized when they know that the uh, images of them are still being are still out there in the dark web and law enforcement is not taking those bad guys down. And so, yeah, I mean, I'll be following this criminal case. Hopefully I'll be able to go to the trial in Georgia when it happens. There's a motion hearing next week to sever the defendants because they're jointly indicted as co-defendants and get them to testify against each other. And we'll see if one of them flips and maybe takes a plea deal and rats on the other and says the other was the one facilitating all of this because Zachary was the one who was apparently sending the child pornography. He was the one who was filming it. He, Since he was a banker, he handled their money and, and their finances. So we'll see how it plays out. But I really would like to see more names. There's to think that there's like a dozen people out there who are not named, who are not unmasked, who are just able to be out on the streets and it's presumed that they're doing more than just possessing child pornography. We saw with the one guy that there was a child in his home, that that 13 year old boy that he was trying to coerce. So there's there's a lot of evil out there that I don't think law enforcement is taking the necessary steps to take down. Oh, there's certainly a lot more work that needs to be done, because if you think about all the branches off this tree, these other people they're sharing it with in many cases have their own children that they're then sharing those images of because they're trading with right. one another. This could extend out to God knows how many cases of child sexual abuse and little kids who are currently in danger. And it just blows my mind that our system is not doing more to protect kids. And especially, you know, I mean, we could do a whole episode on the nightmare of foster care in America and the sexual abuse that runs rampant and the abuse in general that runs rampant through it. But, you know, there hasn't been, I think, enough focus on how we fix this problem in the future. And the truth is we really need legislators to go out there and change the laws and ensure that we become the country with the strictest, harshest laws in terms of consequences that there is in the world for what happens to you if you commit one of these heinous acts against children. I personally believe it needs to be changed to the death penalty. And I'm not being facetious with that. I'm not like trying to get a shot back from anybody. I think it makes the most sense in the world. We've seen the recidivism rates are awful. They continue to commit these crimes once you let them out of prison. They continue to perpetrate against children. And I think that there's no more vile thing you can do than go and commit one of these acts or kill a child. And in both of those cases, I think that it needs to be treated as a death penalty worthy offense. And until we take it that seriously, I think we're going to continue to live in a world where we perpetuate these same problems continually happening because we're allowing an environment that essentially says we need to be inclusive of people more and more leaning into a world where we even are supposed to be inclusive of people who consider themselves, quote, minor attracted people. And that's just something I'm not willing to do. I'm never going to accept this lunacy as normal. It's sick. It's evil. It's wrong. And I think that we've got to really get people in office who are serious about it that are going to do the right thing. And, and that's sort of my question to you. Have you had any feedback from legislators who are trying to say, hey, how do we move this needle in the right direction? No, I haven't. And you would think Georgia being, you know, a Republican-led state down there would do something, but I haven't really heard anything from legislators. I've heard a lot from private, uh, small child advocacy groups that they said, this happened in my state and I had no idea it was happening. And so moving forward, I didn't realize that the state has an office of the child advocate and it's to hold like Department of Children and Family Services responsible for their misdoings. And so I'm working with the family member to formally launch an investigation uh, because the state right now seems like they're patting themselves on the back for a job well done for rescuing the boys from the mansion, but they don't seem to be admitting fault for placing them there in the first place, how the sheriff's office could have stopped Zachary in 2011 and created a domino effect, how the Department of Family and Children Services have some kind of oversight over this licensed child placing agency. And so I would really just like to see accountability moving forward. I will, of course, track the criminal case as it plays out, and hopefully we'll continue to see more defendants pop up. Absolutely. And I can't help but notice with how many, when I posted your story, um, I had so many adoptive families and people that wanted to adopt children 
who were told uh, in states across America, not just Georgia or Tennessee, um, that they were den denied adoption because they weren't fully vaccinated or weren't vaccinated or didn't have the COVID, you know, vaccine related. And I can't help but notice, you know, what if those children had been adopted to a loving family, if they weren't denying families, healthy families that were unvaccinated, this might never have happened in the first place. So it, it, there's this is happening across America every single day where good families that would love to have love a child um, are being denied. And in you know in Tennessee, we had children sleeping on the floor of DCF offices, you know, and this is just inexcusable. And this is a problem, too, uh, with these departments. And they're asking for more and more money. And this is how children are being treated when they could be being placed with loving homes. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we're, we're definitely going to ask you to come on back as this story develops, because I, I just have a feeling this is going to go much further than it has already gone. I just, I just have a sinking feeling there are a lot more branches on this tree that have not been discovered yet and not been revealed. And I know you're not going to let go until all of those branches get, you know, shook out. So as this develops, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get even more details for people to understand how we prevent this in the future. And I think this is multi-pronged. It's legislators, it's individuals taking action and reaching out to their politicians demanding changes. It's that change in the guidelines for sentencing. It's us going after these big tech companies and saying you need to do more, including tracking, identifying, and getting to law enforcement the identities of these, quote, boy lovers who are posting on social media sites you know, completely without any consequence, and in many cases, actually treating this this harmful material of children. You know, there's so many areas of this that need to be fixed. And without your reporting, I don't know that as many people would be. I know actually that not as many people would be as awake to the need to fix these problems. So I just I really appreciate the work you're putting in on this. I know it's hard subject, and it's something a lot of people just you know emotionally have great difficulty dealing with, you know, even having to report on a story like this. So I appreciate what you're doing so much. I hope you keep it up because it's incredibly important work to lead us toward a future where we actually can put a stop to this. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for sharing this story, for keeping it in the news cycle when a lot of people on the left just want to bury it because it's an inconvenient case. Thank you so much, Mia. I wish there were more journalists like you. Thank you. Hey guys, just want to thank our sponsor, Patriot Mobile, a fantastic Patriot-owned company that is challenging these big companies out there like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, who themselves are taking your money and then giving it to organizations and endeavors that you don't agree with. So why not make the change today? Change to a company that is in alignment with your values that will fight for school boards to be flipped. Yes, Patriot Mobile did that. They will fight for the truth to get out there to people. That's what they're doing today by supporting this show. So if you want to be one of those people that is an actual change maker, that lives out their values, make the change today. If you're worried about service, do not worry. This company is working off of these same service standards that the major companies are. The trick is those companies, they want to make you believe that they're the only ones you can trust. But the truth is you can't trust them with your money. So make the change today. PatriotMobile.com, promo code STARBUCK. Thank you again to Patriot Mobile for supporting us in our fight to share the truth with the world. Thanks for joining me on today's episode. If you liked what you heard, tag me on social media, repost clips from it, share it with your friends. You sharing our show is how we grow and it's how we get the truth out there. So if you want to help spread the truth and help wake people up, please go and share our show. Go to our website, RobbieStarbuck.com for more information or to watch old episodes. See you at the next episode.